Here we are. We're back. Potter and the Clay Women Break Free Bible Study. Um, I call it Women Break Free because this is all about you guys. This is about women. And I've been doing this for a year now. And we've been discussing all kinds of different um, aspects of, of discipleship and apologetics, what we believe, why we believe it. But um, right now, we're, we've been going through this um, series about the Potter and the Clay. And it, it really still does have to do with women. It has to do with who we are and how we um, relate to God and, and to others around us. And there are some very unique characteristics of being a woman, a follower of, of Christ as a woman. And um, I like to hit on those, but a lot of those are the same as they would be for men or women, young or old. It's about how we um, are approaching God and how we are receiving what he wants to do in us and through us. This series right now, this is our third lesson, and this is called The Potter and the Clay. I am a very amateur potter, but I do um, enjoy it, and I have been learning a lot. So let me tell you why this is the title tonight. Last week, I told you we were going to talk about fire this week. We were going to talk about the heat and what it does to clay and fire and water and all that stuff. And after I got through talking last week about all the stuff going on with clay, what clay is, the properties of clay, all the stuff about clay and how we are like clay. At the very end, I said, does anybody have something to say? Hey, Kathy, you should say something because you are also a potter. And she said, well, you didn't say anything about pressure. And I said, oh, my gosh, <laughs> you are so right. Every single thing that I was trying to say in all the other words from my thesaurus that I came up with, trying to explain about clay and what God does with clay and how we are molded and shaped, all was summed up in that one word, pressure. And I felt absolutely ridiculous that I had not thought of that word because that was everything. And I thought, well, Kathy should be teaching this lesson, obviously, <laughs> but I, this is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to, that's what I'm going to talk about, because then I couldn't get that in my head. I fell asleep that night. I The next day, uh, going actually to the studio and working with Clay, it's all I could think about was how pressure, how it was related to what I was trying to explain all the, the, the lesson before and what I could do to to talk about it some more and what I could do to explain it. Um, and anytime I feel a little bit confused about any of my lessons or don't know exactly what to do, the first thing I do is do a character study. <laughs> so guess what y'all are getting tonight? We're going to talk about a character from the Bible. So tonight specifically though, we're going to talk about this word pressure and pressure as it relates to us as being clay and God being our master potter. So last time we looked at all these qualities of clay, where it came from, how it's wedged and, sh and shaped and what it what the properties of it are, and that it is a raw material that is part of the earth and is itself one of God's creations. God created the earth, the dust, and then created the first humans out of this, this product, this, this clay, and then breathed into it, gave it life different than anything else God did with any of the other creatures the other creations of the earth. And God compares us with clay, of course. There's a whole ton of scriptures. That was an assignment if you guys wanted to take it a couple of weeks ago to just look up in your, you know, giggle it or get your Bible out old school and look up all the different mentions of clay and potter and clay and dust and earth. And it's a lot. It really is a lot. There are some very specific ones. There's Old Testament ones. There's New Testament ones. And God compares us with clay. And we realize that we are also supposed to be pliable. And we are also just like clay, supposed to be ready to become whatever the master potter has in mind for us. And it reminds us of how God can take our simple selves and turn us into magnificent sculptures and beautiful vessels. That's what these, these verses are. There's actually a verse in Romans. I don't have it in this lesson, but it, it, uh, it has to do with that God has the choice. He can turn us into a, a functional vessel, or he can say, no, this isn't working and throw us um, into a recycle bin. He can, he can do something else with us. There, God has this choice. He has um, control if we're giving him this control. We have a little bit of control too. We have will. And um, what, what we become in the present and then what we are becoming in the future is all wrapped up in this understanding of God being our master potter. 
Last week, there was this term that was brought up at the end of the lesson. It had to, it was pressure, this, this word pressure, and, and it just haunted me <laughs> in a good way um, for, the, for this last week. Pressure is the central technique to every single thing a potter or a sculptor does with clay to turn it into something. Everything is pressure. Nothing can happen with the clay without pressure. Believing in Jesus is the beginning of our Christian life, but the next aspect of living a life in which we learn who he is, is to follow his teachings. Uh, a legal expert in, in Luke, it's described this legal expert comes up to Jesus says, what does it take to gain eternal life? Of course, they were always trying to, to um, discover, you know, ways to like kind of stump him. Um, he was, you know, everybody said he was the best Bible teacher. We're going to come up with a, a way to stump him. And, um, and they also were kind of trying to figure out the truth of the of the world and the word as well and so jesus replied he said okay you tell me what's written in the in the law how do you interpret it and he said you must love the lord your god with all your heart soul with uh with all your being with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself and jesus says that's that's it you got it that's it and of course then he became that passover lamb and he became the um the the new creation the firstborn of creation he died he he um uh died for our sins he died to uh bring us healing and an eternal life and he was given to us by the father that we will not perish but have everlasting life that's the beginning right that's what we all know is what we believe basic christianity 101a this is what we believe to be a christian being a christian and becoming a christian though are not exactly the same and don't 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 get confused let's, let's not go too deep with that theology i'm not but, but being a Christian, saying I am a Christian, and then the process of sanctification, becoming the thing that you are to be, that holiness process, that is a lifelong process. And becoming a Christian, be living out the truth, believing in Jesus, I'm sure a lot of you guys, maybe when you were children, said, oh, I believe in Jesus. I, I, turned, I, I got saved when I was 12. Okay. I learned some stuff. I knew a few things, but I don't know, didn't know anything then compared to what I know now. Um, was I saved then? Yeah, I can say there. Here was this moment, but I also know that there was a a working out of my salvation, a working out of an understanding of who God was. There was my will and my soul and and my heart that was being given over to Him over and over. I think you guys probably understand all that. Y'all pretty a little bit older in the things of the world. The ones of you that I know here on this Zoom, the creative process is also an ongoing event god taking us as master potter molding us shaping us teaching us empowering us giving us purpose and function and it, it, it changes all of that is a, an ongoing process it's a lifetime of just spinning <laughs> and i think you guys are going to relate to a lot of this tonight because it's it's individually there we all go through different things we're a lot of I think all of us here that I'm looking at, you, you guys are all moms, but even if you're a, a guy watching this later on YouTube or something, you, you can understand that this process of feeling like you're spinning or just being in the molding process, we're learning to give into the pressures of God. What Sometimes it's a gentle pressure. Sometimes it's a tough, intense pressure and, to, and we're giving into his plans and to his purpose for our life we're trying to find out what it is we pray we seek him all of those things to try to figure out what that purpose is but hoping that we are on the still on the right wheel not on that wheel over there but on the actual wheel god's working on and and we're on in the process of becoming what god wants us to be when we follow jesus we're saying that we're putting our lives in his hands this is known as oh there's here's the word discipleship the pressure word boop, 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 discipleship God wants us to be like clay, right? Pliable, flexible, in a constant process of being shaped, molded, reworked when necessary, adapting to changes that occur around us. So let's talk about the pressure of discipleship. Now, I know, once again, this is a little bit of the basics, Christianity 101 stuff, but I <laughs> definitely know that I need reminding about what discipleship is and, and what it means to be in the discipline of my relationship because just like anything it can become um you can kind of take it for granted you can take your relationship with god for granted we can become more about 
oh, we're all dealing with mental health <laughs> right now, um, trauma, or we know people around us who are who are dealing with the tr pressure of just even the last few years and, and family and things that are going through different things. We've been through life and death right in front of us um, much more clearly than we've ever had to before. And so sometimes it's easy to just go, you know, I don't, I don't want to deal anymore. <laughs> I don't want to. But the discipleship process is there anyway, because at some point we said, I'm following the Lord, I'm following Jesus. And so he works all things together for good, who love for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. So if we're in his purpose, he's going to continue to help us, even if we're saying, nah, I give up. I want to stop. I'm off the wheel. I'm just going to step off over here. Sometimes you feel like you've stepped off and he says, you know what, just like Elijah, I'm going to give you a snack and a nap. It's okay, just sit down for a while. But really the truth is we're still spinning. He just slows it down a little bit for us. When I So when we read about the disciples that followed Jesus while he was on the earth, it seems like it would have been the easiest thing in the world, right? We're reading about these disciples. We're like, oh my gosh, that would be so cool to be hanging out with Jesus. I would have loved that. Three and a half years they got to spend with him. And, and he was such the coolest guy and everything that he said. I mean, it just was perfect because we're reading the gospels and we're just like, I mean, this is even so simple. How could these guys not understand this? But wasn't quite that easy being they were being called by him oh my gosh this guy is calling me i'm coming here i come jesus they were following him they were listening to these amazing teachings he was like standing up for you know the justice against these mean uh, religious sadducees and pharisees he was he was uh turning tables over and and um he was doing these miracles they got to see these miracles they got to hear him pray in a way they'd never heard they he, they saw a relationship that um, with the father that they never understood. Um, they got to ask him questions. They watched him interact with people from the highest to the lowest in society that included women, that included children, that included the tax collectors, the ones, the outcasts, the Sumerians, uh, Samar Samaritans that were all, you know, considered the lepers, everybody that were outcasts. They, they got a, they saw an entire new way of seeing any anything the, the whole the whole world changed and it seems like so obvious well this was jesus i mean this is great this must have been so easy from our vantage point getting to read all these stories it seems so easy to think that those that were nearest to him would have been instantly transformed into believers in him as the messiah as soon as the words came out of his mouth and they or anybody said i mean john the baptist here's the guy who was the leading the way for jesus and he says they're right there this is the lamb of god who takes away the sins of the world they would have been like oh okay i'm going that way i've already been following you, you john now i'm going to go this way but that's not exactly what happened um it's it wasn't true that they instantly understood what was going on each of the disciples um men and women we mostly of course we know about the male disciples but we also know about the women who were followers of jesus he had a huge entourage of of men and women who supported him who followed him who listened to him who took care of the the needs of him and and the people and, and each other throughout the course of the three and a half years that we know of of his ministry um, um so each of the disciples they went through these three years with questions and they needed reassurances and they had to figure out exactly who jesus was and, and we can see him doing him doing it different ways you know we know the the stories of like john and andrew and peter and and um math matthew and and um I think Nathaniel was the first one that was sitting under that tree. And then we got, of course, Doubting Thomas, the poor guy. He's got that 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 adjective with on his name. But but the the thing is, um, we don't really know how all of them responded, except, oh, we know about old Judas, too. Yeah, um, he got to do all those miracles and then ended up um, uh, uh, dying and being his body thrown into a potter's field, which is kind of a sad thing for those of us who are potters. The one in which we can see the biggest transformation, though, is good old Pete. So when we first meet him, he is called Simon. So I got some cool pictures that I took, like from The Chosen. If you guys have had a chance to watch um, The Chosen um, uh, TV series, it's, it's, there's an app on your TV if you have Roku, or you can, you can um, actually get an app on your phone and just watch all of three, all of the, uh, the videos, the, the, the scenes from this great explanation of what, you know, video of what uh, Jesus and his disciples, how, how it was when he walked the earth always good to go back to your bible double check their their uh, video their lessons i mean their uh their story but um when we first meet simon 
um, we get to see this this fisherman. We see he's he's out there um, with his brother. He's he, or with his team. He'd been fishing. His brother Andrew, who had been a follower of John the Baptizer, he he, he says, "You got to come meet this guy. Everyone's been talking about him." John just pointed him out. So, hey, let's come on, come on. So they must have been pretty tight. They uh, seem to do everything together. And here, right here in the very beginning of John, we see that uh, it says, the next day John was there again with two of his disciples. This is John the Baptist. He saw Jesus passing by. He said, look, the Lamb of God and a bunch of other stuff. And so Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two. And he heard what John says. And he just turns and he's like ready to follow Jesus. And he goes, he gets his brother, Simon, and he says, we have found the Messiah. Now, listen, you guys, they, he just announced it. We have found the Messiah, which, of course, that had a thought process of what that meant to them. Of course, we know from all of our teaching that that meant they thought that meant, oh, he, he's going to go overthrow the Romans. We don't have to worry about this anymore. And so he brought Andrew brought Simon to Jesus and Jesus looked at him and he says, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. Notice Jesus' first words. The only words we know of that he, said, he says right here to, to Simon. You are Simon. You will be Cephas. Cephas. He immediately is, is looking at this lump of clay. <laughs> He's looking at Simon. He says, I see exactly who you are. And I also know what it what you're going to become who you're going to become what the plan is your purpose your function i mean i wish all of us had something this clear spoken to us except that simon of course even though it was spoken to him really no clue uh, and we would really wouldn't either what this was going to mean i'm sure he was super confused but he thought well this guy seems to know me seems to know all about me i'm going to see what this is all about i trust my brother andrew but it was uh, quite a moment where Jesus specifically says, you are and you will be this. So Simon, of course, we notice something kind of weird about Simon that we call Simon Peter. He doesn't speak when he meets Jesus. Now, this is kind of different <laughs> from the Simon we come to know later on, because we're reading this report in the book of John and how he's introduced to Jesus. But later, when Simon gets his voice, he tends to run his mouth a lot. There's a lot of words. This is something I can relate to. I think some of, a lot of us can relate to. Sometimes it may not even be out loud. It's in our head. There's a lot of words in, in our family. We call we, we have we have a bunch of girls in our family. I have three daughters and and uh, and and all the women in our family. We like to verbally process. We all know that phrase, right? We all we like to verbally pro we like to to say words and work it out as we're saying words. Not everybody appreciates that gift that we have as women, but but it is something we do. And Simon seemed to have this ability as well. He liked to process. He liked to say what was on his mind very quickly, and. You know, Jesus didn't always mind. Sometimes he did. We'll see what happens. When it comes to words, this the less Simon says is usually better. The more he talks, the more he gets himself into a little bit of trouble. But of course, we only have just a few stories. We this is three years of 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 him hanging out with Jesus, and and we just have a few of these stories. But they're pretty significant stories when he does talk, and so it's a pretty cool thing to go through and and look at the interactions. Reading about Peter's life as a follower of Jesus is like watching him being actually spun on the potter's wheel. If you think of him as that lump of clay, hey, Simon, here you are. This is what you're going to become. You can see the spinning. You can see Peter being spun around. You can see Jesus working that clay and putting that pressure on P on Simon to become Peter throughout these all of these gospels. You see it in and out, the pressure coming at him. And so we're going to do a really quick walk through Peter's discipleship and see if it feels familiar to our own. Now, I'm going to tell you stories that you've heard before, uh, real quick descriptions of things that were going on with Peter and Jesus and, and see if like somehow it connects with anything that maybe you've done or, you know, something similar. Obviously, you haven't. I don't think any of you guys have tried to walk on water, but I mean, you know, the big faith stuff, just equate it that way. So a uh, few of the facts um, about Simon Peter, he's always listed as the first of the 12 disciples, which is kind of interesting. He traveled with Jesus for about three and a half years. In the Gospels, he's portrayed as impetuous, always speaking his mind and acting on impulse. He gets called out by Jesus several times. Here's a quick list of his failures. There's a whole lot more of those than there are of 
of <laughs> the good stuff, but that's okay because he comes out great in the end. Okay. He doesn't really seem to understand a lot of the parables and the questions that Jesus asked. He and the other disciples are trying to keep children away from Jesus. There's one report that one of the kids may have even been his own. Some, some have said, um, but uh, trying to keep that wasn't a good idea. Jesus did not like that. Walks on water, does walk on water. That was a plus, but then loses faith. Jesus grabs him, saves him. Peter argues with the other disciples over which one is the greatest. Got a little problem with humility there. Peter speaks up in this holy moment. Okay, picture the, one of the holiest moments of Jesus' time on earth. He goes up, at, which, which is a scene I really still do not, to this day don't understand what was going on, but it's called the, the Transfiguration. Moses is there, Elijah's there. Only three disciples get to hang out. And right in the middle of it, without anybody asking him to, he starts talking. <laughs> And he blurts out, the first thing that comes to his mind, hey, hey, maybe we should just go build some houses because you guys maybe want to talk. I don't know. We're going to give you some huts. And, he, and it actually says he said this because he didn't know what else to say because <laughs> the three of them were terrified. Anybody, anybody relate to this at all? Just blurting stuff out, just whatever is coming to mind. And he just starts talking. Can't even really enjoy the moment. Like, just be still. Here's a nice, you know, it's like going to the Grand Canyon or something. Just stand there for a second. Just watch. <laughs> but no, Peter's Peter's talking. Peter speaks for Jesus um, uh, without consulting him at one point, and he commits him to this temple tax. They come up to Peter, and they say, hey, Peter, um, who, why is Jesus not paying the tax? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to pay that. And he goes, and he starts to get some money, which probably ticked off Judas. And um, and then Jesus finds out, and he has to correct him and, he, and give him instructions of I think that's the moment where he tells him to go get the coin out of the fish's mouth. I'm not totally sure about that. But he's like, he's, he's a fisherman. I'm going to do something that relates to Peter can understand, give him some instructions in a way he can understand with the fishes. He didn't have to sleep with the fishes. He just had to go get the money from the fishes. That's a different movie reference. Sorry. And then Peter tries to rebuke Jesus. That was not a good idea from that time. Uh, it says in Matthew, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. This was toward the end of his time on earth and that he had to be killed and raised on the third day. And then Peter took a hold of Jesus and scolding him, began to correct him. God forbid, Lord. So God forbid, Lord, <laughs> this won't happen to you. But he turned to Peter and said, get, me, get behind me, Satan. You are a stone that could make me stumble for you are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. All right. You don't have to raise your hand, but you know, we can all kind of maybe relate to this a little bit, trying to tell God what to do and God having to correct us uh, sternly. Hopefully he doesn't have to call us Satan, but Peter resists Jesus when he says that he is going to wash Peter's feet. That was a pretty big moment. And once again, Jesus is having a big moment here, y'all. All he has to do is be quiet and just <laughs> worship and appreciate the moment. But nope, he's like, oh, you're not gonna wash my feet. I'm gonna wash your feet. And Jesus is like, just let me wash your feet. Come on, just sit still for a second. I just wanna wash your feet. I just want you to sit still for just five seconds. Let me do this for you. Let me serve you. Let me take care of you. Worship. Nope, Peter's got something to say. Peter fails to stand by Jesus, falls asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane right before Jesus is taken um, away and, of course, killed. In that same garden, he cuts off a man's ear while defending him. Look at me doing great things for Jesus. And that uh, Jesus had to rebuke him again, had to heal the man. I believe, it could be wrong, but I think this might be the last miracle that Jesus did. I could, I could be wrong. It's besides the when he told the guy on the other cross that he gets to be with paradise with him. But anyway, it was a pretty big moment that Peter had caused that he did a miracle for this guy. Um, Peter denies uh, Jesus, of course, when he's uh, in front of the, the Sanhedrin. He starts swearing and cursing um, and to prove that he is not um, a, uh, a follower of Jesus um, while he's on trial. And he is, of course, completely overwhelmed by this sin, this denial, the self-discovery of his own weakness, where he had just said, I'm with you, tried to scold the Lord, try to be the one that washed his feet. I mean, tried to do all these amazing things. And then he realizes that his weakness was, and his sin was much more than, than he realized. It was much deeper. And it came out in this time of difficulty, in this time of trial, literally a time of trial 
quits he quits the whole disciple game and he says i'm going back to the only thing i know i'm gonna go fishing guess what jesus found him there it's okay you guys sometimes we uh go back to what we know in the entire gospel <laughs> and i could be wrong on this but my studies have told me because you know i've done the i'm doing the deep work for you guys um in the entire gospel he only looks good in one passage <laughs> in john six it says it, at this uh many of his disciples turned away and no longer accompanied him jesus asked the 12 do you also want to leave simon peter answered lord where would we go you have the words of eternal life we believe and know that you are god's holy one and jesus says ah, you get the gold star for the day he was very proud of him in this whole in the whole foot washing scene simon peter argues with jesus in the trial scene he denies he's a disciple these are really really of course he scold jesus these are intense moments with jesus these are things that it's we may or may not relate to them because we don't have the person of jesus standing right here in front of us we don't have god we don't have holy spirit as a person where you know we're interacting but of course we have worship and we have relationship and we have arguments in our head and we verbally process with the lord and 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 there are things that we know that that he has shown us that are in our own hearts and our own minds and our own flesh that he wants us to deal with that are as strong that are as 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 angry or as um fearful or as um pr prideful um that uh, that simon was dealing with that we also have have to deal with as well he was still becoming peter he was on this spinning wheel he was still throughout all this he was this great lump of clay but this whole process he is being turned in to peter and it takes four gospels <laughs> to get to that and simon he really just he had this image of jesus he felt like he knew who jesus was and who was he, he was supposed to be even though he interacted with him all the time um and and of the, he, the jesus he wanted him to be and rather than the jesus who actually was right there in front of him but jesus kept pulling him in closer talking to him teaching him more giving him um, more insight into who he was and it was a long period of time think about that you guys we have this lifetime we're trying to have a connection with jesus peter had him right in front of him and he wasn't always getting it right it's okay if we don't always get it right but we do need to have this connection with him so that he can continue to mold us to shape us to disciple us to put the pressure on us and not until john 21 way down there at the end of the gospels does simon actually become peter it calls him simon and simon peter and peter throughout the gospels but really this is this moment that you can see it's this amazing amazing passage in which this scared and humbled simon who had denied the lord and here and he had seen the lord risen um when when uh the resurrection day um but then he still didn't really know what to do he didn't have this one-on-one -on -one with them yet and he had gone back to his job as a fisherman he and and this is where jesus connects with them and, and he connects with jesus finally as his lord and he sees jesus for what he'd been trying to tell him all this time and he receives forgiveness and then he receives purpose do you guys remember this passage i don't have it written out here i don't think but it's um it's where he says um uh feed my sheep feed my sheep feed my lambs feed my sheep and and jesus um connects with him again they have this incredible intimate moment and he he goes through these which most theologians say th these these three statements that jesus ma makes have to do with with him having denied jesus three times and now he's giving him a job he's saying i forgive you but i also need this connection i need you to know that there's a purpose for your life there's a purpose for what you need to do next all of this is a part of it all of the the relationship that we have had is all a part of it and now you can take all of those things that you've learned and you can take it into this next level of purpose for peter we have a, a story that plays out it's a very clear story but for a lot of us our purpose it kind of goes up and down we have our purpose maybe in a life that we had in in our our young 20s days you know or our high school days right going into our 20s we might be in college we might be you know starting our career or 
And then of course we have, we, a lot of times we have families or we, we go into uh, new levels of, of career of adulting. Um, and, and now I'm, I'm about to be grandma and, and that's going to be a whole new level, but it, and, but our purpose the, the, the charities we work with, the, the things that we do at church, the, the interactions we have with our family, the, the help that we give to people, even just praying for somebody in the parking lot that needs our help or something all of that is a part of this purpose and it kind of comes in and out and it feels like it changes like oh what's my next mission trip what's my next um calling it at at in, to lead a bible study what am i supposed to do next and and it changes but our big overall purpose is that we are following christ we're following him to change us to to, to love him with all of our heart soul mind and strength to, and whatever those things are that we're doing are the extra things that are changing just those parts of us that kind of clears mud does that make sense so it took 21 chapters for peter to get converted right he 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 did know jesus he followed jesus he declared who jesus was he had that great moment and i think it was john six that was great but this conversion of finally like going straight into that purpose that he had and even then if you read the book of acts he wasn't like a perfect guy he had some uh, he and paul sort of avoided each other they had some some disagreements on some things and and what he did with with uh he didn't do everything right he he, he got he got jailed for for uh for following for speaking about the lord and and uh, uh an angel comes to save him and he doesn't even believe it nobody it's just he, you know he wasn't a perfect guy but this christian conversion is not a sudden thing for most of us it takes time it takes years it takes all of our years and the way Simon Peter became, the way Simon became Peter, the way this lump of clay became this great evangelist, apostle, worker of the Lord was pressure. It was all from pressure. It was all the pressure that Jesus put on him, that God put on him to change him. So remember the first time Jesus met Simon, he told him he would be changing. He immediately, the first thing he says to him that we have recorded, it says, oh, you're Simon, you're going to be Peter. He had fair warning. He, Peter might have been like, Peter, I don't even like that name. What's that name? I don't even, what are you calling me Peter for? It's like some calling somebody like Doug. <laughs> hey, I like you a lot. You're Doug. <laughs> what? Why am I Doug? I don't know. Jesus says, ah, look it up in the Greek. He had fair warning that he was about to start spinning. So it says that, that he was, you are Simon, uh, son of John, but now you'll be called Cephas. Simon finally was able to say who Jesus is, and Jesus declared what Simon Peter was. Back in Matthew 16, he says, uh, that is, was when he says, um, who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and so others, Jeremiah. What about you, he asked. Who do you see I am? And Peter got that mouth on him. He says, I know, I know, I know, pick me. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replies, blessed are you, Simon, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter on, on this rock. I will build my church. You are Petros is the, the Greek. And on this Petra, I will build my church. The words are a little bit different there. The first is uh, a rock. It's significant. Um, it refers to a, sorry, a small insignificant rock, a Peter, Petros. It's just a rock. He's saying you are a rock, which is a nice name. You know, it's a good, strong name. And the second Petra is a massive boulder. On this massive boulder, I will build my church. Now, that's a, a that phrase right there has uh, launched a thousand denominations. <laughs> Actually, just one. Um, the boulder is the, <laughs> the Catholics do believe, the Catholic denomination um, d believes that Peter actually was the first pope, um, the first uh, one who is the head of the whole church. And everyone after that is a follower of this line of, of Peter. Um, most uh, Protestants don't follow that line of thinking. Instead, um, the theology is more that the the boulder, the rock upon which the church is to be built, is not on Peter, but is actually on the truth that Jesus is the Messiah. On you just spoke this truth. The truth is, you are the Messiah, the Son of the Living God. On this boulder, the truth that Jesus is the Son of the Living God is what I will build my church. This uh, the, this is the rock, the solid fact upon which the church was built. But it's also kind of a little bit of a play on words that Jesus does there because we're all thinking, ah, oh, Peter, 
Petros, Rock, Petra. Uh, these are all kind of cool. I like all this. And he is giving Peter this this power. And it does turn out that, it, you know, we know that Peter was listed first among the in the disciples. There's a reason that he was the leader. Um, and he ends up being a major player when we read the book of Acts, these other stories that tell us who he was and what he did on behalf of leading the church. Of course, we also know Paul became a huge leader of the church as well. They had a, a few battles um, and they ended up going their separate ways. They both did great stuff for the kingdom. Um, so so anyway, so this this idea, though, it happened right here in Matthew 16. He says, you are Peter and on this rock, the truth of the gospel, the truth of who Jesus is, is how the rest of the church is built. And just so you know, rocks are formed by pressure. Look, it kind of looks like a spinning wheel. Now I looked it up. Not all rocks are formed by pressure. It, there are a few that aren't, but metamorphic rocks, igneous rocks, those in particular are. And in it, and you know, you don't have to memorize this and, and uh, take notes on this, but I thought it was kind of an interesting little um, diagram that just shows that heat and pressure and and cooling and, and heat again and cooling and all these different things are what form a rock. And that is really what we can totally see in the pressure that came on Peter in, in his story. And of course, in our own discipleship and what it takes to make clay into something magnificent as we potters do with pressure. And of course, under extreme amounts of pressure, rocks, certain types of rocks can become diamonds, which of course is what we're all after, right? We all want to be diamonds. A few of us are diamonds in the rough. Some of us are black diamonds. Some of us are pink diamonds. Some of us are blood diamonds. I don't know. I don't know. All of them don't blue diamonds, whatever they all are. Um, but let's all work on becoming diamonds. But really, God just is asking us to just withstand the pressure. He's going to make us into the rock he wants us to become. Having the ability to examine Peter in the Bible as he came to know the truth of Jesus, it's a luxury for us. Look, we can read the story. Look, look, there's Peter making a fool of himself again. Ha, 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 poor Peter. Not only we can, though can we see him, um, ourselves in him, kind of fumbling through things, asking dumb questions, making huge mistakes, acting out of selfishness, um, acting out of fear, just saying words just because, because Peter's like, just I'm just going to say something else, or I'm going to say, oh, God, you don't want to do this. This is really what you want to do. This is all a part of, of our own discipleship process. We can look at Peter a million different ways. We can see ourselves. We can see our kids. We can see other people, and we can point it out and see what's going on in their own discipleship, and also we can see Jesus' patience with Simon turning into Peter. And we can pray and hope and hopefully have the love and patience of Jesus as well with others who are turning it on the wheel and under the pressure to become these disciples, to become wonderful works of art um, made by the master potter. We can see this love. It, it, I would really deeply, strongly encourage you to, to just start looking through, um, you know, do a little giggling, do a little concordance and see what Peter is up to, what was he, what was he, um, what these situations were, and then see how Jesus responds to him. Sometimes it's harsh, but it's never, hey, you're out of here, kicking you out of the, off the team. It's, okay, we're going to, we're going to start over. <laughs> we're going back to the basics, Peter. This is, this is what we're going to have to talk about again. I'm going to explain this story to you again. Um, or I'm going to show you how to love the people around you again. If we're going to give, you know, filet of fish and baguettes to all these 5,000 people, I'm going to need you to figure out how to take care of the ones who are just hanging out all the time. I need you to figure out how to clean up. I need you to figure out how to, to give some hugs and pats on the back and realize this is a bigger story than just filling people's tummies. What is this really about, Peter? Come with me now. I know you know about the fish. Let's figure out if we can go to the next level. So this is all what Jesus is doing. He does it with me constantly. I know he's doing it with you guys as well. Jesus, oh, somebody's, oops, mic is on. Jesus put Simon Peter under intense pressure. He was asked the very hard questions and got the hard rebukes. And often it was in public. I'm thankful that most of the time that does not happen with me, but those of us who have been in any kind of leadership know that uh, those public um, moments can be the worst for us. Um, sometimes it's just that other people are seeing us. And sometimes it's when we do something publicly, silly, stupid, pridefully, angrily, whatever it is, and nobody else may know it's just in our hearts 
Jesus is dealing with us later. And sometimes it can make us crash. There are definitely times I've been in leadership a lot through my whole life. And, um, and those moments can make me shut down. I have to be very, very careful because I will just say, you know what, forget it then. I don't want to hurt myself or anybody else anymore. I don't think I can do it right the next time I will shut myself down. And it takes a while for God to get me, get, get going again, um, because I can find, you know, I can find some art to do somewhere. I can find some coffee to have with a friend and not get up in front of anybody again. And uh, because of mistakes, because it, I, I internalize it and I feel guilty. I feel shame. I feel sinful. I, I can't take it anymore. I don't want God to be mad at me. Um, those kind of things can shut us down and it can shut you down even if you're not a leader where you just I, I want to please God or you may just disagree with God you know God I don't I don't I don't think you're right <laughs> and I, I, I'm, I'm not I'm gonna do what I want um, and you know that's that's a whole nother level that uh, God can uh, teach you through but keep looking at Peter and seeing what uh, what the way God dealt with them and let yourself be changed from Simon into Peter in your own life. This is what changed Simon into Peter. The, the tough questions, the rebukes, the pressure, um, the quiet ones and the public ones. Um, the whole point is we're, he's trying to turn us into Christ to look like Christ, right? That's what Holy Spirit is trying to do. In Acts 2, I mentioned this a little bit before, Peter, along with 500 of Jesus' followers, were waiting in this upper room. This is in Acts. This is after the Gospels. This is after the, the, the con connecting with Jesus again. And Jesus um, uh, goes, goes to heaven. He says, I'm going to, he blows on them and he, he fills them with Holy Spirit. But then they get empowered by Holy Spirit. Go read, go watch my lesson on, on Holy Spirit. Um, and, uh, and it explains a little bit of this. There's a whole nother level of empowerment that they, they get. And all of a sudden they are all changed, but there's one that gets, that gets noticed. And it's Simon Peter. He becomes the rock. He becomes the, the bold one who then begins the rock, which is the church, the gospel. It's all tied in there together. He boldly proclaims the gospel to thousands and they, they come to be followers of Jesus. And it's only been, um, I believe 50 days since the resurrection of Jesus. They've, they've been with Jesus for 50 days. They got to see him as the resurrected Lord, the Messiah, and, and, and things began to work in their heads like, oh, this Messiah thing, it's, it's different. It's about overthrowing sin. It's about our connecting and having a relationship with, with God as Father, as, as Son, as Holy Spirit. It's not just about, oh, we get to have wealth and, and the Romans are going to be gone and maybe we'll be in charge, thus Jews will be in charge. Nope, it got to be a whole lot bigger than that. And this was that moment that he became this powerful thing. Now, Carrie, this is going to make you crazy. Don't look at it too fast, but much, but I thought this was a really cool video. <laughs> it's a video from the inside of a vessel being made. Um, uh, from the inside, you can see I'm um, going up, and I just think it's a great picture of the pressure. Peter was imprisoned several times. He was beaten. He was even brought before the very same Sanhedrin on trial that had condemned Jesus while he, ha G Peter, had denied him. Jesus had put Peter under a tremendous pressure throughout those three years together. It was on going nonstop, made him dizzy, made us all dizzy just to read about it. And as one of the closest three disciples to Jesus, he got to know him even more intimately. We know John was the one who was called the beloved, but John and Andrew and Peter um, were the closest. They were there for significant moments. Um, uh, that Jesus had that no one else experienced. He got to know him intimately, learn truths. And, and, you know, he was asking a lot of questions all the time. And also he had higher expectations placed on him. And some of us do. Some of us have higher expectations. Some of it's because, you know, we, we are we're called to be teachers or we're called to be leaders or to serve um, in, in ways that no one else is serving. Um, these are all different ones. And it happens for us at different times. Um, and in different relationships, it's in, uh, the expectations are higher uh, than maybe in other relationships, and, and whether it's a work thing or a family thing or whatever, um, a church thing. But we, um, we are called to be close to Jesus. And there are certain times where, where the expectations for us and the pressure on us 
is even higher. We can look at these the letters that Peter wrote. Supposedly, we're not totally sure. Those theologians who I like to look at and listen to on podcasts, I'm not totally sure that First and Second Peter, especially Second Peter, was actually written by Peter um, or you know transcribed by Peter. I'm not or, or uh, dictated by Peter, but if so, it is kind of an interesting look at at who he was, a man who knew Jesus so well, who had walked through the shaping and molding that he had. He was later able to write this beautiful explanation of who we are in Christ. So Peter later on in his life, it looks like he wrote these letters and he indicates that those who choose to follow Jesus are born again. Where did he learn about being born again? Oh, he learned that from, from Jesus telling about, oh, you know, I had this uh, conversation with that Nic uh, Nicodemus guy. How do you get saved? How do you get what? How do you get born again? All those things, and and he explains it in this letter. And that from that moment of salvation, God views us differently. He sees us as this creation, and this is all in these letters that he wrote. He had this deeper understanding of who God was. We are, and he describes how we are his beloved, God's beloved, obedient children who have been born into this new identity. Peter, Simon, became, he, he took on a new identity. The new identity in Christ affects all that we are, including the way we see ourselves, the way we relate to God, the way we relate to others. Understanding our new identity, crucial in our relationship with God. Just like if you, um, if you get married, you take on an identity of becoming connected with someone else when you have children when you have grandchildren any kind of any kind of family moment or if you have someone in your family who gets married and comes into your family um an in-law um you you take you connect with them in new ways you have to get to know them in different ways and and, and this identity we're always looking for who what is our identity how i explain my identity we're our identity in christ um, is the way we relate to God, the way we relate to others, all very important. And God is molding us and shaping us and he's super patient with us. I am so thankful for that. Okay, this one's going to drive you a little crazy too. Very cool time lapse, but I really like it. And the reason Peter was able to write these things is because he had been through so much. He understood identity because his identity had changed. Same person, same guy, same fisherman, but the way he was used, the way he was called, the way he understood who God was, the Father, Son, who Holy Spirit was, all very significant, and he was able to write it and explain it. Peter's complete identity has been transformed and continued to be transformed. Like I said, in the book of Acts, he continued to have new understandings of what it means to be a Jew, and then also how to now um, explain the kingdom to the Gentiles. And he, he wasn't for that at all, but he had to become, uh, get more understanding of who they were and who, how God saw them. And it was all because of what we've talked about before. When you, when, when you take clay and you wedge it and you get air bubbles out and you center it on the wheel that, and it does not want to be centered. It wants to fly off. It wants to do its own thing, but eventually it begins to, to come into like a, an agreement with the potter, like, okay, I, I can go a little bit further with this. And then eventually can even become carved and, and shaped, transformed by this slow, steady pressure of God shaping us or shaping what, what happened with Peter. When Jesus said, follow me, he was inviting Peter into relationship. Same thing he's done for us that he does with, with when we go to people and we say, I want to become like, um, I, I want you to know about Jesus. And um, I'm getting distracted by the video too. <laughs> I, want to, I want to become like Jesus. And or, excuse me, when you ex offer people the salvation, you say, would you like to know Jesus? And, and you can invite them to follow Jesus. He want, God wants a relationship with us. He wants a relationship with others. And we can help people to find that. Um, and it's about spending more time with Jesus. It's about becoming who um, Jesus wants us to become. And, and it's learning to love God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength through all of eternity. And, and right now, there's a lot of, there's a big phrase, big term going on right now. It's called deconstruction. I am, I am for deconstruction. I like deconstruction. Deconstruction is big generally it's the concept of i am taking all of these things i was taught when i was a young christian growing up and i'm and i'm throwing a lot of it away and i'm going to figure out 
who God really is. Uh, and it's good. It, deconstruction is good because to me, it's it's loving God with your mind. It's saying, you know, I'm not going to accept every single thing that I've always been told. I need to be careful and 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 um, and look at things a little differently. The church has gone. Certain churches, certain denominations have gone ways that mm, that, that doesn't make sense. It, it, it's not in the word. It, you can see the way it's it's causing problems. Uh, you, you know, those of you who follow me, I'm, I'm uh, very aware of, of um, pa patriarchy and complementarianism and how destructive it is for women and for families and for men as well, and how whole denominations are built in entire um, theologies, and including a whole translation of the Bible, the ESV, all centered around trying to put men and women especially into certain roles and categories and control them and um and and breaking free of those kind of false theologies are good but a lot of the deconstruction movement right now that is very catchy with younger people especially and churches are are losing their numbers that deconstruction movement is um discouraging discipleship it's discouraging saying, you know what, pressure is hard. And yes, I want you to figure out the theology. I want you to look deeper. I want you to, to, to see what this Bible that can be kind of confusing and words mean different things. And, and, and what is, what are these, these certain phrases and, and books and things mean, but we also um, can't just deconstruct so much where we go, you know, I'm throwing it all out because um, discipleship is a, a, a pressure. It is, it is discipline. It is continuing to work toward doing what God asks of us, figuring out how to follow him, how to love others, how to put others before ourselves, how to um, take the love of God to others, how to receive that love as well. There's a lot of mental health um, talk. I'm all for dealing with mental health. Obviously, it's a great thing. I love it. I got I got enough of my own mental health issues. But I've also realized that even in the last year or so that I some very specific things that I've had to deal with that that shut me down. A couple things in particular just shut me down. Like I, I couldn't I barely I don't really have anxiety issues, but it took me to levels that I had never known before. I've ended up, you know, doing things like I've started kickboxing. I'm really good at, you know, like punching things and trying not to picture people too much or anything while I'm doing it. But, but, you know, trying to deal with those kind of things. But, but I realized the other day that, you know, as much as I was letting certain things, situations run through my mind over and over and over again, I couldn't get them out of my mind, the trauma of it. I just wanted to throw everything out um, and disappear. And um, I just finally said, I'm just going to start confessing. I'm just going to start asking forgiveness, even if I didn't think I really did anything wrong. I'm just going to go ahead and say some things. So I just started talking, which really had been all kind of pretty internal, but I, uh, for me dealing with it, and I was having conversations with God, but there was mostly just sort of me talking. And I just started saying, God, I'm not sure, but I, I, I ask forgiveness for this. I ask forgiveness for this. I ask forgiveness for this. I think I may have done this and I shouldn't have done this or I, or I, or I didn't do this and maybe I should have. And I just let it pour out for a few minutes out loud. I did it out loud. I really didn't think it was going to have any matter, but I cannot explain. There was a, there was a, a miraculous moment that happened for me that, 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 that moment of, of confession, um, repentance, I guess it was, or just, just connecting with God and, and saying, I need you in this. Um, it, it, it did something in me and it was still things I I'm, I'm still working through. Um, but it, it did change something quickly. And, um, and then it, it, it was like a moment where I had, I'd be, I'd been coming up to this wall over and over again. And that wall finally disappeared or almost disappeared. And I was kind of able to get over the hump a little bit. And even though I'm still working through a lot of the issues, it, it was a moment where I said, I, there's a, there's a certain discipline that I do know that I'm supposed to have with God. I do need to walk through repentance with him. I need to um, connect with him. I need to worship. Um, I need to read the word. These are disciplines that I've learned from childhood about my relationship with him. And, and I, as I renewed those and changed the way I interacted with him, that trauma and the the feeling that I wanted to deconstruct, which was basically in my head was basically throwing everything out, not Jesus out, but just like throwing away. Ah, I can't deal with any of this anymore. 
um, I, I went through the disciplines that I'd learned and, and I walked through those. So, and it changed, it helped, it helped a lot. So um, I think all of us, as we have young people around us, or as we're hearing those things ourselves about what a deconstruction or, or throwing away a lot of old um, understandings of who God is, American white evangelicalism is, is um, kind of the, the big phrase and, and way of looking at things now that we're we're changing um is uh is don't throw it all away at once <laughs> kind of walk through the steps or help other people walk through the steps of learning to love god with all of ourselves and it's a lifelong process it's a it's a it's our eternity the close relationship that jesus and peter had uh, peter did not run away from jesus when he was corrected it's that's an important aspect when things get hard when got things got hard for peter he didn't run away he, he probably got angry and tried to scold jesus a couple of times probably turned on his brother and had a row with him but <laughs> he didn't leave jesus he learned how to lead eventually he learned how to lead he was, he was already a leader he was just a natural born leader but he had to learn how to serve the way jesus served lead the way jesus lead how to have faith for miraculous things he had to learn a new way of making decisions, um, and, and he even had to learn how to die. The legend is that that Peter died, um, well, we know that he died as a martyr, but um, the legend is that he was uh, crucified upside down, that his wife was also crucified, um, and, and he was made to watch, and, um, and he shouted out encouragement um, to her <laughs> encouragement, encouragement, but sh shouted, uh, to have faith, um, for her and then ended up being crucified himself. Um, he, he learned that <laughs> he wasn't willing to do that. Um, just a few years before, as he watched Jesus and ran away from the, the, the trial, but then he ended up learning how even to die. This is all a part of our own discipleship. It's, a transformation that we go through in our mind. It's a pressure that comes from the transformation of our heart. It's transformation of our character, all aspects of pressure. I'm not going to sit in and talk about each one of those things, but it's about trimming. This is a vase that I was trimming. And look how wonky that vase is, you guys. <laughs> it's, it's a wonky vase. This is most of us. This is a big old wonky vase that I said, you know what? I, I It got this far. It's kind of cute. I kind of like it. I'm just going to just go ahead and just trim off some of the extra pieces. It had already been made into uh, a, a piece, a, a pretty little vase that I knew somebody would like. And it turns out I, I, I was able to give it away or, to someone and say, Look, tell me what colors you want it to be. And I made it into something fun for somebody. But it's just about um, another part of the pressure that Jesus, that God puts on us. He, he gets rid of some of those extra things that are holding us back. It's all part of, of the raising up of walls and turning a vessel into something and then trimming off all the extra stuff. Um, the potter, a potter puts pressure on a vessel for its entire life. Of course, we know about, and I probably next week, I'm going to talk about uh, fire and, and water and, and what that does to us and to vessels. But it's all about our body, our strength, our soul, our will, our relationships, our loves, our service, our humility or lack of humility. Everything is under pressure to make us more like Christ. We change by repentance. We change by admitting that we need the potter. We change by saying, you are sovereign. You have a plan for me. I, my will is in your way. Keep changing my will. I want to draw closer to the pot, potter. I want to uh, uh, be closer because of love. I want you are love. I want to become love. <laughs> show me how to to do all that so this is about pressure you guys and it, you guys can handle it you can take the pressure i know you can we're all together in this we have other you have others around you that can help you as well i'm i i can as well but but always know that jesus as much pressure he as he may be putting on you as holy spirit is putting on you he's got you he loves you he's just saying just just hang out with me let's worship Let's let's just walk through this together, and um, and we can we can we can get to the great big amazing moment um, that uh, I will get to have with you when we get to hug in eternity. 
Father, thank you so much for these ladies, for those who are listening. And, um, and, and we thank you for pressure. We thank you for teaching us who you are um, and how to become more like Christ. Please help us, give us endurance, give us strength, and um, give us um, uh, great moments like Peter had where he um, was able to hear and see and change his heart and his, um, his life uh, to become the vessel that you have for him. May we all be the vessels that you want us to be in Jesus name. Amen. Okay. Next week, hopefully next week, if we get to meet, um, we will be talking about fire and water. That will be um, the, uh, uh, the, probably the last big thing I do in regards to pottery. We're just going to talk about what it takes to make a, a decorated vessel or a statue, but mainly we'll be talking about vessels and, and what that, what that intensity is and what, what water and fire how that is represented in our own lives and if you want a little homework i would suggest as i've already mentioned maybe doing a character study of jesus and peter and their interactions maybe you just take some notes and say okay here's what peter did and here's how jesus reacted to it and then just connect with jesus and say hey jesus maybe you and i help me to see how you're doing that with me as well does anybody have any well, hey paula hey. um anybody have any questions or thoughts you have to hit unmute and don't forget you're being recorded nobody all right look how brilliant i am <laughs> i'm gonna end this and then and i have a couple announcements so nobody um nobody leave yet but uh thank you guys um make sure you if you haven't watched them yet go back and watch some of our other stuff about the potter and the clay and and even some of the other videos that are on our resource page because i think that'll help you um see what the heck i'm talking about if you <laughs> about all this clay stuff i'm really kind of addicted to it so i hope you guys enjoy it too and really the, you know, the truth is if you get a chance to go put your hands in some clay come up to our, the studio where i work or or if you're near somebody who has a studio just do it one time whether you're on the potter's wheel or just making something by hand with clay even if it's just like a little elephant um do it it's fun and you're gonna your god's gonna give you plus it's very therapeutic <laughs> touching the earth realigns all your electrical system but take a chance and and go do that if you if you can because it's uh it's it, it'll show you a whole new aspect of who god is love you guys stay right there Oops, hold on, hold on, hold on.